Hi, I'm Pat Hoffey, and I'm here to introduce the uh, legendary Laurie Nielsen, who's known in a lot of different roles, but mainly, I guess, as part of Propana and a fabulous artist. Welcome, Laurie. Thank you. Now, Laurie, um, I want to talk to you about something we've talked about more recently. And one of the things you said to me at the time was that a lot of artists, and you know this because of your many years teaching at um, Queensland College of Art in the Kaya area, you said that when a lot of young Aboriginal artists start painting, they often paint about their home life. It's a really strong instinct in them. And you said to me, and I could be wrong, so tell me if I'm wrong, that for you that happened too when you started getting right into your art. You drifted back very quickly to your early years on the Bungle Creek. Yeah, I've, I've, I've realised after seeing some of the younger artists come through and, and, and looking back on my own life that I think it's something we're comfortable with and, uh, and, and you know, when you start out producing art, you're not quite sure what you want to do and you're trying to find your feet. And, and um, so family's comfortable. You know, you paint about family and, and place where you come from. Mm. In many ways too, if you've got a family that's as rich as yours is, it has probably got all the issues that you needed to provide you with, you know, subject matter for a whole lifetime of art. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, everything from growing up on the camping ground to, you know, everyday life and uh, work and... Um, um, the types of work my 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 ancestors and that done and and um, it was it was just a, a a part of growing up back then. And yet, you know, we read it now, we talk about it now. It seems like an almost you know another time zone away, which it is, I guess. And and I don't know whether people even hearing those stories now could even think about growing up in that way. Can you describe a little bit about how you grew up and where you grew up? Well, I, I lived in a tent till I was 15. The referendum changed that. and um, But, you know, we didn't want for anything. We, we had um, good food, clean. Um, and I... When I started producing art and talking about the camping ground, a lot of people used to say, well, gee, that must have been hard growing up without hot running water and because everything was heated up in coppers. And, and um, I had to go back and talk to my, my mum and my aunties because, uh, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, and I was in my element. Growing up on the creek, I mean, I always say I had seven kilometres of playground. Fishing owls, swimming owls. So that's why we didn't get to school sometimes. And sometimes that, that creek would flood. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't go to school because it was flooded, but we could be down there swimming in there all day. But it wasn't like you were in one tent. There was, there was seven k's of that creek bend with a series of creek bends. And there was a lot of people there, a lot of families. Oh, yeah, there was probably 26 families at the peak and not all Aboriginal families. It was a mixed, mixed crowd. People used to come and go. all depends on the work. So this is just in a small country town, Roma? Yeah, and just like a lot of those um, country towns, I think they call us fringe dwellers. Because we are just on the fringe, out of the road. But those fringe dwellers were what those country towns depended on to get the building started, the land cleared. Yeah, yeah, they'd done a lot of the vital work. And it's something I had to come to terms with too. You know, my all my uncles, he, he was a... One of my uncles was one of the biggest contractors going and he employed everybody, give everyone work and um, cleared all that land. But uh, I realised that if he hadn't have done it, they'd have brought outside contractors in and they, they wouldn't have looked after the country like he did. Uh, so he was from the Roma area as well? 
Yeah, we were all born. That was um, your mu- your mum's brother. Mum's One, brother. Yeah. yeah, and so he employed your dad along with other people in that work group. Yeah, yeah. And tell us about your dad, where he came from, and how he got there to Roma. Um, he jumped off uh, navy ship in Sydney in the late forties. Worked as a lifeguard. And he was a Norwegian. Norwegian sailor, yeah. And it didn't take him long to wind up in Western Queensland after working on the Snowy Mountain. And that's where he met Mum and uh, they had 13 kids. Together. And your mum was a tiny woman Look from look from the local area. She was a little short woman. Dad was probably six foot two, blonde haired, blue eyed and he's prime. <laughs> Bit of a bit of a funny mix. But your dad would go out working for long times, like away when they cleared that land, fencing, yeah. wood, timber cutting. Was he timber cutter? Or was uh, that- they, they were all axemen, yeah. Axemen. Yeah. And then your mum would hold, she'd hold the fort. Yeah, like a lot of the other mums, they'd, um, they'd uh, look after the kids and get them off to school and do all the things mum's done. But not only that, she stood up to a lot of pressure at some stage when they wanted to move those families off. Well, when the um, referendum um, happened, um, it was up to the government, the councils, to move everyone and find them accommodation. Um, I remember talking to Richard Bell one day. They they actually uncondemned a house in Mitchell for his family to move into. But... um, Mum, being mum, she just stood her ground. She said, I'm not going anywhere. She said, this is my country and I'm staying right here. And everyone was going to stand behind her, but um, they slowly left over the 12 months until she was the last person to leave. And, and, and I guess we didn't realise at the time how when it went to court and the judge threw it out in her favour, how important that little land rights win was, you know, because we, you know, there was no media. We didn't know what the big land rights struggle was about. And, and uh, yeah, he's this little woman, fought the battle by herself. And mm. Yeah, not publicity, not a great big hero, but no. standing a ground with the kids behind her and saying, yeah, bring in the doses, but I'll still be here with the kids. She had this saying, I can remember all... Growing up, um, if she knew she was right, she used to say, I'll defy Christ off the cross. It didn't make any sense to me at the time. <laughs> Once you got to know her, that's what she'd do. What a ripper. And so, Laurie, your journey from the Bungle Creek to be a full-time artist, artist educator, project director, all the things that you do today went through a number of curves just like Bungle Creek did. Now, one yeah, of them, yeah. one of the best bits is when you're a jockey. Now, you left home before the other kids did and headed for Brisbane. Yeah, I come down at 16 and we didn't do those sorts of things back in them days, but, you know, when you're young and you're, you're reckless and you want to do silly things, that's one of the silly things I wanted to do. If I had my time over, I'd do it again. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing, yeah. But it was a passion. I mean, you loved riding. You, there was no really, it wasn't like anyone in the family was a rider before you. You just. No, mum's cousins were drovers and that, but we didn't have a lot to do with horses. But then you'd get out on those ponies that you'd rent, you'd ride outside town on the flatlands, yeah, and you'd go off for help. We'd ride, put our lines up real short, tuck our jeans in, and um, race across the flat. Hose the horses down in the creek. And the other thing at that time, Laurie, is that there was one in particular, there was a couple of good Aboriginal riders that were known to you and they were like people who'd really made their way and made a, a reputation for themselves in racing, yeah? Yeah, and one was um, Darby McCarthy. And uh, when I tried to emulate him, I was... I seen him on a news reel winning the Metropolitan and the um, uh, the Epson, the two big races one weekend, two biggest uh, 
races on the Australian calendar and he was my hero. So when we used to hire these three horses, I was always Darby McCarthy. And my cousin was always Frankie Rays, another na Aboriginal jockey. And Uncle Eddie, who was always going to run last on this little white pony, we didn't care who he was. But Darby McCarthy was quite a, I mean, you, the way you've described me to him, he really looked something. He was... Oh, he went to France to ride. I mean, top hat and tails and everything. Top hat and tails. Had his own valet and... He was big time. I wonder how much of that sort of survived in you to want to be that kind of a... No, I didn't want to be that big. <laughs> anyway, so you find your way gradually back into art. Now, I want to shoot forward to a particular project with the State Library of Queensland, which is an enormous project um, which fronts the GOMA, the new GOMA, the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. And that's a project that you became involved in and it had its difficulties from the beginning. Yeah, it was, um, I love the way it panned out. It just fell into place. But I'd been away working on construction and that's what some of us do sometimes. We go and uh, pay our credit card off so we can come back and uh, do some art again for a while till we max it out. And, and um I'd been away and I, I was standing in West End and a, a community person come up and said, oh, you're back in town. I, we've got this project. It's pretty well dead in the water, but um, we can try and um, get it up and going again. And when I, when I talked about it, it, was, it just seemed like it was just far too big. There was just too many people involved. I mean... There was a lot of interest in it, so there was that many community people involved and elders and it just got bogged down. And, and um, sometimes uh, architects, they don't think like we do. So <laughs> there was um, communication problems. and But anyways, they said, look, what we want, they had trouble getting artists, I said, what we need is a good cross-section of Aboriginal and Islander artists from across Queensland that could work on this project so that it was all fairly representative of um, Queensland. And I said, well, that's perfect. I'm back at uh, Bovakai and I've got access to all the students that come from all over Queensland, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. So... Um, we set about design and um, that wall. So you brought those practicing art, young practicing artists together to do it as a group. Yeah, yeah, and we and we um, turned it into a community project, like uh, involved um, at, at a university level uh, as part of one of their projects. Oh right, okay. And that that's always. Um, We've been lucky to be able to do that a couple of times in different projects. That's interesting, Laurie, because that was in 2006 when they eventually got it up. So you were talking about the fact that prior to them approaching you, the community in West End, the uh, Aboriginal, local Aboriginal mob in West End, prior to them pro uh, approaching you, you were off, also off working in construction to make mm. money. Yeah. So by that stage, you're a pretty well-known artist, but you're saying, I guess that's a story of how, no matter how successful you look on the outside, artists continue to have to struggle at some point in getting money together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's that's still the case for most of us, you know. Yeah. Um, things have changed a lot. I mean, the opportunities now um, have presented themselves over the last... 20, 30 years, I mean, you've got people like um, Richard Bell and Vernon R. Key and um, Gordon Hawkey and Judy Watson. And, I mean, all those people have helped lift the profile. Yeah. Things are changing. I mean, your own work, you've just mentioned some of the members of Proper Nine, um, and the people that you didn't mention would include, I guess, 
certainly Jen Heard, Jennifer Heard, who was yeah. like you, uh, very instrumental in getting it off the ground, and she also was instrumental in getting Kaya up and running. Yeah. Um, but has always r- remained committed to community as well as having face as a, a well-known artist. Do you think that's important to keep one foot in community? Um. Not all the time, but it, it, I think it's uh, I think it's important, um, and and yeah, especially in the Aboriginal community. I mean, you can't get too big for your boots, of course. Just, um, what happens? Oh well, I've always said that you know, there's a Aboriginal people love to see Aboriginal people do well, you know, but they do too well for too long. Because the ones that put you on the pedestal will be the ones that kick the bastard out from under you. Might be the same everywhere. I think you're right. Now, Laurie, some parts of your artwork have really become a symbol of yourself. You know, people see any, is it Gorbury, any emu image, and automatically think, Loz. Yeah, it's, there's a few things, I suppose, that have become a bit of a signature, I suppose, the barbed wire and... Yep. Uh, and the emus, I'm pretty passionate about the old emus because that's our, our totem, mum's totem. And and tell me about what they do when they get to a fence. Well, especially now when the drought's on, they um, there's no water around and they, they just pace up and down the fence because they can smell the water but they can't get through to it. And they'll do that for two or three, four days, and then they'll try and step through the fence and that's when they get tangled up. And they'll just hang there till they die. It's a tragic sight, yeah. I it's a pretty... I come across about 30 of them once and there was 15 of them already perished, but I had to go and get a stick and, 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 and put about 15 of them out of their misery. And that really knocked me about a bit to have to do that, mm. but it was a humane thing to do, you know. Mm-hmm. Laurie, what drives you to make your art? I mean, you know, you've got all these other things that you've had to do, like we've talked about working in community, teaching. To be able to then push yourself to go back to the studio and make art, what is it that drives you to do that? I, I don't know. I said to Gordon Hooky one day when we were in the studio, it's... Uh, you know, when, you, when you're working on a piece and it's working out fine and you've got to down tools and run off and do something and you, you can't wait to get back and pick up where you left yeah. off. and that's, that's when you're in the zone. And um, I just love... Um, I, I just love making art. And um, I, I said to Gordon, it's a bit like, um, you know, our ancestors, I suppose. It's a... It's the act of doing it that's important sometimes. Mm, not for sure, yeah. Do you have any hopes for what your art does when it's out there, when it's been bought or it's in public collections? Do you have any hopes? I'm, I'd probably look at my art a little bit differently because a lot of it's fairly robust sort of stuff. I mean, I, I was quite amused when I went down to Tandania and uh, see all the gallery staff handling barbed wire and, and those big fish traps with white gloves on, you know. If I went to pick those traps up, I'd just walk in, grab them, throw them in the back of the ute and away I'd go, you know. Because <laughs> they're built like that. And once they become art, they re- reach well, that, they, yeah, that they, next level. Well, they're still art. They're, they're, they're art when you hang them in the gallery. And those traps... I could chuck them in the water and they'd catch fish. I would uh, build them exactly the same as if I was building them out in the bush for catching fish. So your early training in that, the skills of bushcraft stood you in good stead as an artist? Yeah, well, all, all that uh, construction stuff and uh, I've been lucky to be able to learn all those skills off people and... Um, and apply it to um, some of my, my art making. And do you did you see a role for you teaching students in the same sort of way by working beside them and showing them? Well, I think uh, the students, uh, that's the comments I get from them, that, is that 
that good hands-on stuff that uh, you don't always get at, at university. And Maybe you're getting less and less of it now. Probably, yeah, you would, yeah, yeah. Laurie, I want to ask you a question about that way of learning. Do you think that it takes time, slow time, to work with materials to really understand them? Yeah, it took me a while. I'd done a little bit of fencing, not a lot, but enough to know to respect barbed wire. And, and barbed wire is something like you, you don't muck around with it. You, you've got to grab it by the scruff of the neck, you know. If you get tentative, that's when it's a little bite you every time. Yeah, and what about like drawing skills? Because you went to college after the family moved back to Brisbane. You actually started after your jockeying. Um, you enrolled in a course at Queensland College of Art um, that took you into a far more formal training. Although you'd always loved drawing, is that right? As a child. Oh yeah, it got me into a lot of trouble at school. Every Every textbook I ever owned was just full of doodles and scribbled, scribbled all over them. And was anybody influencing you when you think back on that time? Yeah, when I was... Um, I'd often go out in the camps on the weekends and um, holidays and um, a few of the men used to do art while they were out there to pass the time and I was always there looking over their shoulder and... Would they be sketching what they saw? Or what? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and they used to show me how to draw and stuff like that. So you kept going with that, even when you were working as a jockey? It was just something that was always there? Yeah, I've always sort of dabbled a little bit, yeah. And then your mum and dad eventually moved down to Brisbane. Yeah, they, they come around um, after I did. With the rest of the kids? With the rest of the tribe. And that was the point of time when Sam Senior said to you, what do you want to do? Yeah, Sam Watson and um, I finally, mum and, mum and dad had met Sam and Eunice and um, um, I finally got to, to, to meet him and um, he asked me what I wanted to do. I knew I was about to give jockeying away and I said, well, I wouldn't mind doing something with my art so um, I had a half a dozen little paintings under my arm and he he lined up an interview and uh, at the old College of Art and went and um, I was uh, able to uh, enrol as a mature age student. I'd done commercial art which was probably I wasn't sure what I wanted to do but uh, I'm glad I done that. They're skills I still use today because I'm an illustrative sort of artist. Yeah, it served you well. And at that college, at the same time as you were enrolled as a, a um, mature age student, there was somebody else who was a bit of a mate of yours who was uh, enrolled at the same time. Um, two other Aboriginal guys, yeah? Yeah, there was... Um Ron Hurley, he was 12 months prior to me. Oh, so he'd gone by the time you enrolled? No, no, he was still there, oh, but yeah. he was uh, 12 months ahead of me. And uh, a good mate that I'm, I'm still real good mates with now, I met him there, and a bloke named Lamarkey Pip. Yeah. A mm. uh, very good artist too. Yeah, both Ron and Lamarkey also went on to be terrific artists, incredible yeah. Yeah. visions. Um, and you also met a couple of people there with whom you've retur retained a lifelong friendships, associations, Bob Mercer and David Paulson. Yeah, that's where I first met um, David. And, and back then that was, um, you know, that was early days at the uni for me. And um, Laurie, were they different days to what the uni's like now? Oh, shit, yeah. Tell I mean, me why. Tell people. Well, you know, every university should have a David Paulson, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was um, a bit of a bit of a firebrand, a bit of a loose cannon back then. But 
very good teacher, of course. And, yeah. But the general feeling of the uni then? Yeah, it was, a, it was a, just a really good place to be. I mean, people just having fun and producing art. Probably not as serious as it is now, but... I wonder. But I remember when you came back to do the lecturing and when the Queensland College of Art was over at Seven Hills, so it was yeah. in a suburban campus. Yeah. You put quite a bit of effort into making the Bovakai headquarters a place where people could drop in and have a feed and a talk. It was a shed, basically. It was an yeah. over, overhang yeah. Yeah. and no. a barbecue pit. It, went, it just had that good community feel about it and the community used to drop in and it's one of the, that's what makes that course unique, I suppose, that uh, people like Gordon Hookie and that will just drop in to see how the students are going. I've never known our universities to have that happen. Now, about that time, probably a little bit after that, you and Michael Ether met. How did that happen? Um, Michael was um, organising a, a fairly big show called Balance, along with Marshall Bell, and and uh, he he actually popped in out in Roma, and that's where I met. Michael. He came up to you at Roma. I was doing the rounds, catching up with artists all over Australia, organising this big show, Balance 1990. And um, so, uh, yeah, he wanted a, a, a little piece off me and I was able to, I had one. So... Um, what was it like? The piece? Yeah. Um, it's actually in the... It's in the library now. It's uh, axes. Ah, the axe pieces. Yeah, the little axes, yeah. So how closely did you get involved in the balance show at that time? <laughs> Sorry? How, like, how closely were you involved? You were an artist that oh, was included well, in it. We but... were just um, we were just sort of all hanging out. It was all new to us, but it, um, it just opened so many doors, I think. I mean, it... We got introduced to lots of other artists, and um, some of them artists were we, we'd met for the very first time. I mean, some people met Lynn Onis and the Chris Hodges and people like that. You know, and just uh, there's, there's still people we know today. And then you started working together uh, in a studio shared by. There was a group of you. There was David Polson. Yeah, well, um, Michael and David were sharing an old house and a studio and um, um, ended up moving in with Michael one day. I rocked up and we just finished a relationship and everything I had was on the back of my ute. I said, can I move in there? He said, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> and did you get much art done? Yeah, yeah. No, we've done some good projects there. A lot of campfire group projects. And how long did it take? How long were you working together before you started thinking, look, we need a gallery? Oh, well, that just sort of happened. Um, didn't, Michael didn't set out to start a gallery, but it just happened. We were just trying to organise shows and, yeah. So I realise that what we're talking about to this point, we're talking about your art, which is key to everything that you do. And it's something that keeps driving you. But what I keep talking about is also how these communities keep forming and reforming. And so it's like I can't separate them. No, it's probably all interwoven, isn't it, when you think about it? You know, the community and uh, the, some of the projects. And... Now, some people maybe not anybody, maybe just me, thinks that that balance 1990, because it got so many black fellas into the gallery and because it upturned the idea of doing a cleanly curated show that you know exactly what's going to happen before you get it in the gallery, that was nothing like that. It really turned the tables, yeah. It was, um, it was a absolutely huge show and it, it I think, I still say it changed the landscape in Queensland, you know. 
I think it, well, I would say, Laurie, that it also potentially changed the landscape internationally because it then became a kind of a, a, t- a litmus test for the Queensland Art Gallery to think maybe we should go international. And very soon after that, we had the first APT, the Asia Pacific Triennial, in, in 1993. Well, I, I, I find. Uh I feel a little bit privileged, actually. I often explain to the students or younger artists that, like, it was um, a train that was leaving the station and I just happened to be there, so I jumped on <laughs> so and went for the ride. Yeah, the train ride. So how lucky... Do you get to make... Did, do you get to make the train ever or is it just always chance in life? Ah. It's... Um, I haven't had to change trains. <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> same stopped. Old, same old train. No. Okay, any particular works or series of works that are most close to your heart? What ones do you reckon have really been crackers? Uh, I think some of the recent ones, the, um, the Entrapment series, I quite enjoyed them. That's... Um, uh, yeah, and a lot of my, a lot of art over the last 16 years is about comments Pauline Hanson Absolutely. made and uh, she's been good for me. Can you talk a little bit about what entrapment, that, what that work does, what it talks about? Um, there's, there's a few here, um, that crucifix with the trap on. I didn't want it to be about religion, but I mean... Some some religious, um, you know, Aboriginal people have been in trap. Um, it, it was a comment she'd made about uh, a case that got thrown out in court about these fellows who got caught with a bit of fish in there. And um, they said, oh, do you think Aboriginal people should get special rights when it comes to um, to fishing. And uh, she said, no, why should they? Aboriginal people didn't use nets. And it was just such a dumb comment, you know. But then I realised it was the um, it was the journo who was uh, baiting her up to, you know. So he got the response he wanted. We're well, a very fair man. So, I mean, you started with Pauline Hansen and that was back in the All Stock Must Go, I think, in no, 19... No, uh, it was before that? Black humour. Okay, so yeah, that's... About 16 years ago. Yeah, well, well, yeah, that was the fish and chip shop. And you pulled a whole heap of people together for that too. Yeah, right? that was a campfire group project. So that was 1998 when you set up a fish and chip shop to, that was kind of a response to Pauline Hansen's fish and chip shop in Ipswich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you had a great time. Yeah, no, there. that was a, a really enjoyable project that. And then on the basis of that, you th- rolled that ongoing critique, of well, political critique really, that was aimed at Pauline Hanson specifically, but it was really capturing a, f- a kind of a, a black humour response to racism in Queensland and Australia. Well, I, th- I think that's why I like the show. Um, you know, at the time people were angry and... Um, and, and, and the show was good because it, I thought, here's an opportunity now to use humour to, um, to, to, um, yeah, to, to, to square off without, you know, running out there throwing tomatoes and eggs at people. And that's been strong in all your work and, and in your teaching through your Yeah, I suppose there, there's a little bit of humour. I, I like to not get too serious, you know, but. I think that's a bit of clown in me too, you know. The rat bag. Yeah. So for that all, talking about rat baggery and the skills of rat baggery, which a lot of people seem to have forgotten, um, the old stock must go when the whole team got together and parked a van outside the Queensland Art Gallery during the Asia Pacific Triennial 2, which was in 1996. That was cheeky, wasn't that it? That was so cheeky, Blurry. <laughs> So you had this bloody van on the footpath outside when all the other artists 
who were in there were cramming to get inside the white walls of, of the Queensland Art Gallery, you know, big pomp and ceremony. ceremony. What did you guys do? Well, we bought a truck like a cattle mover and we bought it from the wreckers and bought it in. And our idea was always, even from the first APT, I can remember some of the criticism from uh, some of the overseas artists that they were really disappointed that they come here and they didn't get to meet Aboriginal artists. They, they thought they would be um, mingling and, um, and, and spending a lot more time, but um, it didn't happen, of course. And uh, So we always thought, well, if we park this truck here, we can bring a couple of hundred artists through, which we did. And, yeah, we had hundreds of... Just explain for people who might be listening to this and can't understand. So you had the truck. What did you do with the truck? We just parked it um, almost at the beginning of the bridge. And what was in the truck? It was um, it, it was a, a, a pretty well little retail shop. It was called All Stock Must Go. And it was about um, how, how um, art's a commodity. And we had artists just sitting around painting and producing artworks and painting up the truck and, yeah, and did, it was good. Did it get? Did you make a lot of sales? Yeah, we made sales. So it, it, it's a comment on what was happening in the gallery. Yeah, well, it was getting beamed live inside too to um, a really sterile sort of clean environment where people could watch it all from a safe distance, which was probably about 80 metres away or something. But, so, the people inside the gallery are watching what's happening out in the heat of the footpath. Yeah, just out there. <laughs> and people who are depending on making sales for a living. Mm. Yeah, no Good way. one. Good. Good one. All right, I want to talk to you about barbed wire. What is it about that material? You've talked about it a little bit, but... It's something that you know so well. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, from very early in, um, when I started to use it, I realised that I, I only wanted to use barbed wire on political pieces, I'd use it as a medium, and it, I suppose I branded it then. I mean, since you started working with it, barbed wire has also become something that's synonymous with so many other things, like the borderland of Australia and keeping up refugees and yeah. keeping in Aboriginal people. And well, I, I think that's why I, um, right from the beginning, I thought, um, you know, everyone, everyone around the world knows what barbed wire is about. Every war, every... Uh, sometimes it's built. Uh, it's it's uh, to keep uh, cattle and that in, but it's also to keep uh, people out. I've got scars all over my body from diving through bloody fences, and all I wanted to do was fish and hunt. And you got to cut through someone's land to get there. You got a few scars. So do yeah, you think? Do you running, think running the gauntlet? Do you think that there's a place for politics in art? Oh, for sure. For sure. Some people don't. Mine, know. Um, yeah, I probably. Mine's a little bit subtle, I suppose. My my art, not not like the Gordon Hookies and um, and people like that. But um, I mean, I look at Gordon's work, and it's really, really powerful stuff. And, He's a storyteller. But, but uh, you know, political art is um, it, it's so necessary. Why? Well, I, I've seen a couple of times where you can put something up on the wall and you can actually get a little bit of dialogue happening, you know, where sometimes that just doesn't happen for one reason or another. Do you think it's been a, a tool for the Propanar group, political art? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I suppose that's been the main, the main driving thing behind uh, proper now is uh, the, the the type of art that some of the artists do. 
Do you think it's made a difference, Laurie? What type, what year did Propanar get set up? 96 or something. All right, well... Not sure. Okay, well, we, you know, what, 30 years? I, um, I was a member of it and I didn't know. I was away working. <laughs> and no room she went. And uh, Mel and Warry turned up and said... Your name's been bandied around in Brisbane a bit. And I said, what for? I haven't been there to do anything. He said, no, you're, you're part of this what now mob. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Vern and uh, Richard had already started the group. and uh, With Jennifer Heard, yeah. With Jenny and then they, uh, yeah, made me a member. I found out when I come back. So there was Richard. Vernon, Jennifer, Laurie Nielsen. Yeah, and then Gordon Hooky come along. Gordon Hooky. And now we've got Megan Cope. Yeah. Tony Albert. Who Tony am I, Albert, yeah. Who am I leaving out? Well, part part of the proper now charter was to to mentor two younger artists, and at the time it was Andrea Fisher and uh, Tony Albert. That's um. So, um, but they've uh, grown up and went on to bigger and better, better things. things. Yeah, that mentoring thing has been important to you as well, hasn't it, in your role? Yeah, I suppose uh, Richard played a big role in that too, um, with Tony. But you've mentored kids through Bob Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, and I like doing that. You know, that's, um, that's something I enjoy doing. I've heard you say, Laurie, that sometimes you feel you get taught more by them than you give oh, them. Oh, yeah, you've got to be open to that. And, yeah. I'm going to go back to that question I asked before. You guys have been at it for a long time, right? And you've been hammering away at a lot of things. Um, I could say racism, but let me just say an awareness of contemporary Aboriginal people in everyday life. That would be one of the things that Propanar talks about. How much difference has it made on the Australian community? Oh, when, when you talk to people, I'm sure it's had a big, um, uh, 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 yeah, it's had a big, made a big difference. You know, people love talking about the issues, and uh, when uh, when you got someone like doing powerful art like that, they um, they. Uh, they, they um, love to get their teeth into it and talk about the issues. Do you think art might offer a better way for people to have dialogue together than a newspaper article? Yeah, I think it's a bit more real, don't you think? I do. And I think that it's almost like the third person in the room. Yeah, it's, yeah. Right. Because people put so much time and effort into creating it, becomes something you have to respond to, maybe? Mm. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, there's another thing that's associated with that is that when you teach, when you're working with younger people, or sometimes people the same age as you, on art in a teaching situation, the ideas change than if you just speak to them like we are now, like if we had something we were working on at the table here together. I suppose that's a good thing about discussions and, and talking about art and, you know, things evolve and the, all the time spent in the studio when we had that great studio at Amersham Street, you know, we'd all be working on our own projects but sometimes you just sat around and talked about art and that, that was just... Uh, that was just great. So that was the Amersham Street Studios, which sounds like an amazing time in oh, well, West End. And there was you and Richard and Gordon. It was three years we, um, three of us lived there. We were all single at the time. Three bachelors, me and uh, Gordon and uh, Richard. And we had a whole, whole studio to ourselves. And it was the ideas as much as the work produced. Well, we, we lived there and we breathed and, and just got up and produced art when you wanted to and it was just a really good environment. Amazing. It's probably still keeping some of your ideas going. You're still drawing from that pool of conversations. Mm. 
Laurie, I want to talk to you about a, sh- a piece that you did for a, a fireworks show in, ni- in 2003. And the name of the fireworks show was What Have You Done Lately to Change the Situation, which is a great title, I think. And your work was a canoe, a barbed wire canoe, and it was called Band-Aid Solutions. What was that work about? Um, it was one of my very first barbed wire canoes, so, um, and, and it's that old saying, you know, uh, when you're in a seem, seemingly um, hopeless situation, you up shit's creek in a barbed wire canoe without a paddle. <coughs> and it was about the demise of um, ATSIC. ATSIC was just starting to fold and... So the canoe Can I stop you for a second? Because people don't even know what ATSIC is now. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Australian and Torres Strait Island Commission. Uh, consultative Con- Committee, yeah. Consultative Committee. And it was a, an Australian um, uh, national um, Aboriginal body that represented um, uh, Aboriginal um, affairs. Um, and a voice. All uh, yeah. under one umbrella. And um, it was set up, I think it was set up to fail but it, um, by the government, but it, um, it just um, done a lot more than they thought it would ever do. It's interesting, Laurie, that we're looking back now after the voice from Uluru was denied a voice, if you like, that people are now thinking about ATSIC and the power that it did have. They're thinking about it in much more uh, positive terms nowadays, Yeah. It brought the country together, do you think? Oh, for sure. And for a while divided some of it, but um, that's what happens with big organisations, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and in terms of that name of that show, like what have you done lately to change the situation, what was that about? Who, what, what, what was that question about? Not quite sure. I, I haven't got a, a grip on the show, but... Would have been Michael's title, I reckon. Yeah. Um, and it would have had. A- I think. Um, yeah. Look, look, I can. I know. What, um, I think what happened. We'd been quiet for a while, and I. I think. Um, yeah, we wanted to do something, and I suppose that was a good title. Resurrect and some of the, um, maybe some of the older work and. And, and talking about some of the new stuff that people were doing. So it's talking about engagement and later, well, earlier on we were talking about, and you just said before, about that thing of being quiet for a while. And I guess some people have thought about you as someone who's a quieter personality within, say, the Propanar group. But I've seen you act in very positive ways over the years when you need to. And you take your time to judge when to come in. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, I suppose that's a fair comment. Um, you know, I can lay dormant for a while, like a big carpet snake. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then it's time to move. I've got to move and do something. Yeah. And we were talking uh, prior to this about the way in which. You formed a few communities. Like we start at the Bungle Creek community. That was a community. It wasn't just you. Yeah, no. It wasn't just your good. family. No, no. It was all these people who were refugees and, as you call them, fringe dwellers. Yeah. And then if I can just jump forward, a long way forward, to, apart from your family, you forged communities when you've lived together with fellow artists. I, I think that's... Um that comes about because we're good mates. We've all got a common interest, and um, it's really easy to to to, um, to to do things like that when you you you're with the right group of people. But uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, and then the dynamics change when the people change. And you're doing a lot of work that has to do with some pretty heavy political issues. How important is it to have fun? Well, I probably don't take it as serious as I should 
or uh, a, a series of some people. You know, there's always still a little bit of tongue in cheek with me because, you know, realistically, you, you can't let them things bog you down either. You've got to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Have, have there been times when you felt like giving up as an artist? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, um, but it doesn't last long. But, but you're right, you do. Um, things get a little bit tough sometimes. And, you know, at the end of the day, I've, um, and I, I've never been ashamed of, um, uh, of doing that. Is, uh, there's times when I've had to prostitute myself, you know, to, to sell artwork. I mean, I'll do, do, um, I'll do stuff that I normally wouldn't do, but I don't do that anymore, but, there's times when rents had to be paid. Oh, yeah. And what do you mean, Laurie? Like, what what would be some of those things that you might not normally do? Like commissions, oh, do you mean? Of, or Mainly touristy sort of art, you know. Bread but, and butter. Yeah, yeah. I've even made earrings and shit like that, you know. It all feeds all, in. Yeah, no, it's all being creative anyway. I think maybe art, people art that don't make art, put division barbed wire up around things and say this is good, this is not good, but when you're actually making using stuff. Yeah, yeah, true. I mean you know, you, you, you still produce an art, aren't you? Absolutely. But they're just different levels. So going back to um, let me take it back to that is it Torrington Street where you were living with David and Michael. You guys were involved in a whole heap of projects around that time, and I'm talking about, say, 93, Mm. when um, Balance had happened, but then you were working with Michael Eyre to to compile some other stuff. Yeah, well, that's when Campfire Consultancy sort of was already begun. That was Michael and Marshall and... and, um, they decided to to uh, work on a database, which is a lot of re, lot of um, documentation of uh, slides and all sorts of things that Michael Ed got involved in, um, and it was, it was a big job. Hadn't been done before. No, no, that's right. And that's became the groundwork for. Um for the Kaya, for Bova Kaya, the yeah, Bachelor I mean, of Visual um, Arts and Indigenous Contemporary Art. He's got lots of skills, Michael. He does. Um, yeah. Laurie, if you were to give advice to some young kid who's thinking, I wouldn't mind having a career in art, but I'm a bit worried about it, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, I've often talked about it to... Um, um, high school students, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm honest. So you you have a duty to be honest. I often say, you know, art's got me around the world bloody eight or ten times, and I've been able to travel because I don't need to to stay at four star hotels. I'm happy to crash on someone's floor. Another artist. Uh, for just on a mattress, that's uh, that suits me, and you know I'd rather be hanging out with artists mm. than in a hotel room by myself. Mm. So I, I I'm just I, I tell students that's how I've I've done it over the years. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to to everyone. I mean, there's some really tough times. Um, I mean, I, I can get by on a smelly rag. What, tell me about what you see as the toughest of times. I suppose even when things get really tough, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to starve. I can go out in the middle of Brisbane and get the biggest heap of bush tucker going. Really? Amazing. I got 200 witchetty grubs along the freeway one day. <laughs> Did you eat them there on the spot? 
I had to get them for a wedding. <laughs> On the free one? I had them. I already had them in the freezer. The, the chef said they snap freeze, which they do. Three, uh, about four days out from the wedding, I looked in the freezer and I had a dozen left. So who'd been eating them? I was just coming home, picking out on them. <laughs> Laurie, when you look back, um, like to those days around 1993, one of the things that sort of feature in my mind back then is that there was a lot of people who were black and white who were working together and didn't think too much about it. They just sort of got something to do. Well, we, we just had a common goal and common interests and um, I, I said to Mike and I were talking one day and I thought, you know, reconciliation become a bit of a trendy word there for a while and I thought, we just sort of looked at each other and thought, we've already been doing this for about 10 or 12 years. And yeah, it's sometimes look back and you don't realise what you're doing at the time. Like, yeah, no, we just, um, you know, we just had those things in uh, in common and we just, we just loved what we were doing. And you just got on and done it and had fun. It was always fun. Always fun. And I think about that story about your mum when the bulldozer drivers had said to her at some stage that someone was saying, you've got to move out of that. You've got to move out of that tent on the side of that creek. You've got to move out. We're going to send in the doors, doors and take the whole place down. And she looked at them and she said, you send in those doors. I'll be there with the kids. Yeah, she said, you can send in the doors, but um, I'll be sitting in the camp when you doze them. And it just become a standoff and that's when they took it, of course. And that is as great an image of land rights fight back as you can think of. I can still see that little woman with her hands on her hips like that. Clear as day. Thanks, Laurie.